BJTs, are they current controlled or voltage controlled? Meaning, do you operate them by changing the voltage at the base or by changing the current going through the base? If you ask this question about the field effect type of transistors, FETs, such as JFETs and MOSFETs, the answer is immediate, voltage controlled. But if you look around, all over the internet you will find quite a bit of debate on whether or not BJTs are current or voltage controlled. Now the consensus seems to be current controlled. Anyone who says voltage controlled is generally looked at as being pedantic. And I happen to agree with that assessment. It's sort of a perspective thing, really. On the one hand, BJTs are voltage controlled because the voltage applied across the base to emitter junction, the PN junction in an NPN, affects the depletion layer in that junction, affecting the quantum mechanical properties throughout the transistor. And you apply a voltage across the collector to emitter, which in conjunction with the base to emitter causes current to flow through, and we commonly apply a voltage varying signal such as an audio signal to the base, and that's how we change how much of a signal is coming out of the transistor in an amplifier. Or if we're doing digital logic and using them as gates, we're applying high and low voltages. So everything seems to point to voltage as the control. But in reality, unless you're a quantum physicist, what matters is they behave as if they were current controlled, a current controlled model. We model them as if they're current controlled, the same way we model a resistor as a little symbol on a circuit and ignore its capacitance and inductance and ignore the wires and all this other stuff. We use a component model of an electronic circuit to make them easy and practical to work with. The same for a BJT. It is, in every practical sense, current controlled. But let me not tell you, let me also show you. For a standard NPN transistor, we generally operate it very simply. You have an input and a throughput signal, which can be the same power source, don't go into details, this is just how I'm describing it. And you have resistors controlling the current. You have an input signal, this is your control, that goes into the base. You have your signal, your power supply that is being controlled by the first one. And then, of course, your common emitter arrangement. This is how a lot of amplifiers work. This is how digital logic works. Common emitter is how you're usually going to operate a BJT. It's called common emitter because you have both signals connected to the emitter. So one is going through base to emitter, one is going through collector to emitter. Now, we already recall that you have to forward bias the base to emitter junction in order to get this to turn on at all. And we have something called the beta, which is a multiplication factor. Current going through base to emitter is multiplied by this amplification effect into how much current is going through the collector to emitter. Now this again is a model. It's not actually amplifying, it's throttling. If the transistor were not there and this were a wire, based just on the resistance and the power, there would be a certain amount of current running through this. The transistor will either let all of it through or less than all of it through. So it actually clamps off the current based on its control. When it's fully open, it's simply not clamping it off appreciably. So once again, the amplification is a model, but it's sensible to our brains and it works. Now, there's something called saturation. Saturation means the collector to emitter junction is effectively not there. It's such a very tiny voltage drop that it's as if it was a wire and this whole thing is letting through the full current. And that is based on the beta. Now the beta varies, it can vary wildly from 40 to 100 or even more. Beta is not a nice stable number. And good circuit designs either don't care what the beta is, such as digital logic, they just care that it's there, or such as a common emitter amplifier with a voltage divider like we've been doing, with that emitter resistor, it is designed to nullify or dampen the effect of that beta changing. So the first question we ask ourselves, if this is voltage controlled or current controlled? Well, if it's voltage controlled, then we could use voltage with very little current to open this thing fully up. Let's say this is five volts and this is 10 volts. So we could apply in principle five volts here and 10 volts here, but with a gigantic resistor that lets very little current through some, but very little, and we would get saturation here. We don't. No matter how high we turn the voltage up here, if there's not enough current going into the base, it will not reach saturation here. So that is part one 
of how it is current controlled rather than voltage controlled. On the other hand, if it's current controlled or voltage controlled, if we have a low voltage here, but a high current, so a small resistance, let's say we have five volts here and one volt here. So with five volts here and whatever this resistor is, at saturation, this not here, we just have V equals I times R. So voltage divided by resistance equals current. So that's the maximum saturation current we could expect. Can we apply a low voltage, a high current, and get that saturation when the base and collector are still wildly different in voltages? Yes and no. Yes, we can use only a single volt here with high current because one volt is enough to forward bias the base emitter junction and turn the transistor on, and then we apply sufficient current using its wildly varying beta to multiply up to this maximum saturation current. But remember, as the current goes up, as this thing goes towards saturation, the voltage drop across the transistor shrinks. V equals I times R, this is an ohmic device. Whatever the current going through here is, the total voltage through the whole system gets split between these two. Resistance doesn't change, total voltage doesn't change, but current does. So voltage equals current times resistance. So you have your base current here leads to a collector current. That current at that moment times this resistor's value equals the voltage drop across this resistor. When the transistor's closed, it has the full voltage drop. Current is zero, so this voltage drop here is zero. When this is at saturation fully letting it through, then this has a voltage drop effectively of zero. The current is the maximum amount of current, roughly, with rounding, that there would be without this transistor, just a wire. So it's the full voltage equals full current times resistance, or current equals voltage divided by resistance. So it's taking all of it, and this would be zero. So if this has a zero voltage drop at saturation, right? That's what saturation means. It's letting through the maximum current, which means this has to be roughly zero. This has to be roughly all of it. So at saturation, the collector voltage is going to be roughly zero because here's ground. This resistor is taking it all. So emitter is always at zero. The collector goes down to zero and the base is at whatever. It's basically this voltage minus roughly 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, whatever. And then this resistor is taking the rest of that voltage, which is how you determine current. So you can see that if this is at saturation, collector to emitter junction is zero voltage drop. Emitter's at zero, collector's at zero. Base is at 0.7-ish, which means the base to collector junction is also forward biased. NPN, PN from base to collector, PN from base to emitter. It's not two diodes, but conceptually there's two diodes in there. And this is what we were trying to do if we were saying before, is it voltage controlled? Could we have five volts here, 10 volts here, and low current? At that point, base was higher than both collector and emitter, but the current was still too low to get it to saturation. So forward biasing base to collector and base to emitter is not enough. This is why we say it's current controlled in usage. It's voltage controlled. It's just voltages all over the place. This doesn't do anything. None of these things do anything. These two power sources do something. They create voltage. And the physical construction, the electric field spreads through them and makes things happen. But like I said, that doesn't matter unless you're trying to do quantum physics. If you're trying to use a transistor, you modify the current. Whether you're doing it with a variable resistor or you're doing it with a variable voltage signal, like one of these, doesn't matter. We model it as a current controlled device. So let me show you with my multimeter that this is true. So I have here two multimeters. I have a 2N2222 NPN transistor. I have a USB 5 volt source, currently reading at 5.27 volts, and I have my power supply. I'll turn up the current limit and leave the voltage at zero. And let me move this other multimeter over here so I don't accidentally block them. So two multimeters. Now I'll use the power supply as my base current. So I'll go from the positive of the power supply into a 10,000 ohm resistor. I have 100, 1,000, 10,000, and 100,000 ohm resistors. So into a 10,000 ohm resistor. I will connect the multimeter on the left through this resistor to the base to measure the base current. So positive comes out of that 10K resistor and negative goes into the base, like so. Then I connect the emitter to the negative of the power supply. Now, 
I will connect my 5 volt USB power into a 1000 ohm resistor. I will connect the positive of the second meter, the one on the right, out of this resistor. The negative I will connect directly to the negative of the USB without going through the transistor. So I'm getting about 5.2 milliamps. So this is what we would expect. And this is our maximum possible current. We cannot violate the laws of physics no matter what we put in this circuit. We are not going to be drawing more than this because that is the minimum amount of resistance we'll be going through. So this is what we would expect to be able to get out of this transistor. So I remove that directly to the negative and instead I'll plug it into the collector. And then I will connect the emitter, so basically sharing a ground, over to the negative of the USB. Now we have a full circuit and we're getting zero current. I've got zero volts over here. Let me turn it up to one volt, 5.1. We're almost already there with only one volt, and I'm getting very little base current. Let me turn down the sensitivity. 33 microamps. So 33, 34 microamps. Let me turn the voltage up again to two, to three, to four, to five. Let's turn it up to 12. So now I'm getting, if we go back up to milliamps, 1.1 milliamps going through that base, but still only 5.1, 5.2 going through the collector. We've added 12 volts across the base and there's five volts in the supply, the USB, and it didn't go higher. It's hitting that maximum limit based on the resistance, so that's saturation. So I'll turn the voltage back to zero. Now, that demonstrates that we can reach saturation with a low voltage. The collector was at five volts. The base was at one volt, but it was letting through enough current that this resistor that was connected to the collector had the full voltage drop across itself. The collector to emitter passage basically had zero voltage drop, so the collector itself was all the way down close to zero. So it was one volt, or rather 0.7-ish, at the base itself, about zero-ish at the collector itself, while applying five volts to the collector and one volt to the base. Now let's do it the other way. I am going to switch the base resistor to be 100,000 ohms. So now the base, instead of going through a 10,000 ohm, is going through a 100,000 ohm. So I'll turn it back up to one volt. 0.9 milliamps, about 900 microamps. In fact, let's turn it to microamps. 954-ish microamps going into the collector with only three or four microamps going into the base. So let me turn it up to, oh, now we got some current over here. So now we're up to 3.3, but we had to go up to two volts to do it. So this is 13 microamps into the base, 3.36 milliamps into the collector. Let's go up to three volts, four volts, five volts, six, seven, eight, See, at 5, it's not quite there, only 5.10. I have to go above 5, 6, 7, before it gets high enough to say it's really truly saturated. So not just forward biasing the base to collector, but all the way up. We had to put through a whole 63 microamps to get up to 5.2 milliamps, base and collector. So this shows it's not purely voltage controlled. There is a correlation between base current and collector current with the same voltages. But let me turn down the volts one more time. I'm going to switch the collector resistor to a 100 ohm from 1000. It's on 1000 right now. So I'm going to send this 5 volt USB through a 100 ohm resistor with still 100,000 ohms on the base. So let's go up to 1 volt. 3 to 4 microamps, 0.95 milliamps, base and collector. Let's go up 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Turn this up a bit. So I'm getting 23.9, 24 milliamps with a 92.93 microamp current base and collector. So you see, that's great. You know, it's still working fine. But just for safety, let me turn it down one more time. And now I'm going to change the base resistor, the base resistor now, down to a 100 ohm. So both the base and collector will be going through only 100 ohms. So now let me turn the meter up and voltage to one volt. Instantly 49.9 milliamps with two milliamps on the base. Two volts, three volts, four volts, five volts, still 50. Went from 49 to 50, less than one milliamp on the collector. Meanwhile, we went up to 38 milliamps on the base. Let's go down, back down to one. 
not to belabor the point, but in every practical sense, we look at a BJT as current controlled, no matter the fact that voltages are what's actually doing the thing. No matter how blindingly obvious you might consider something to be, no matter how useless you might think this video is, it's still worthwhile to say out loud. It's still worthwhile to see it in action, to do it with your own hands, and prove to yourself. So much of science relies on models, electronics, especially computer electronics. Meteorology is another good example that relies on models. Population analysis. Anything that uses a lot of statistics will use something called a statistical model. There's an entire field of research into pseudo-random number generators to feed statistical models for analysis of all kinds of things. There's nothing wrong with models. There's nothing wrong with thinking of models. Trying to say a BJT is voltage controlled, as I said, unless you're in a quantum mechanics class or you're trying to study it, Trying to say a BJT is voltage controlled is silly. It's not stupid, it's not wrong, but it's silly and counterproductive. So now that we've seen it with our own eyes, I'll be seeing you.